Welcome to the online lecture series on Macbeth. Today we shall discuss the first scene of the fifth act, that is the famous sleepwalking scene. This scene is very significant because it exposes the inner fragility of Lady Macbeth in front of the audience as well as to, to other characters who are a physician and a gentlewoman, a lady attendant who has been attending to Lady Macbeth and this scene is uh, significant because it shows the sudden collapse of Lady Macbeth's personality as well as her psyche as well as her mental strength because of the load, the burden of anxiety and remorse from which she has been suffering for a long time since the murder of Duncan. The scene is situated in Dunsinane, that is the castle in which Macbeth is now residing. And the stage direction says that this particular scene is situated in an anteroom in the castle. Anteroom is a rest room or a smaller room that is uh, used for taking rest. Enter a doctor of physic and a waiting gentlewoman. A doctor of physic simply means a physician, a doctor. A waiting gentlewoman is uh, a parlor maid or a lady attendant. The doctor speaks first. He says, I have two nights watched with you, but can perceive no truth in your report. What was it she last worked? Sorry, when was it she last worked? So the doctor says that uh, I have been watching Lady Macbeth for last two we last two nights, but I cannot agree with your report. Uh, it seems that the lady attendant, that the gentlewoman reported to the doctor that uh, Lady Macbeth uh, had been sleepwalking. She had been walking and talking and doing things in her sleep. To which the doctor cannot agree after having watched Lady Macbeth for two consecutive nights. And uh, he asks, what was the time when she last walked in her sleep? The gentlewoman replies, since His Majesty went into the field, since uh, Macbeth went to the battleground, I have seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed. So the gentlewoman reports that uh, she witnessed Lady Macbeth doing several things like uh, writing something on a piece of paper, reading it, folding it, sealing it, and again returning to her bed, all the while she has been fast asleep. Yet all this while in a most fast sleep. So all the while uh, she had been doing all these things, she was fast asleep. The doctor says, A great perturbation in nature to receive at once the benefit of sleep and do the effects of watching. So the doctor concludes that this is a great turbulence, a great disturbance in nature, in one's personal nature, in one's uh, mental state to receive at once the benefit of sleep. To be able to sleep and at once uh, having awareness or having the quality of being awake to do to perform all such things which only uh, fully awake men and women can do then he says in this slumbery agitation besides her walking and other actual performances what at any time have you heard her say so now the doctor inquires of the maid, of the gentlewoman, if she heard Lady Macbeth say anything during her sleepwalking, during her somnambulist state. 
the gentlewoman then uh, refuses to convey any further information to the doctor she says that's a which i will not report after her uh, i cannot tell what she actually did i cannot uh, narrate that ditto i do not want to do that the doctor says you may to me the doctor says that uh, as i am a physician as i am a doctor you can disclose the secret to me and it's and it is most meet you should here meet means uh, appropriate suitable or proper this is as i am a doctor this is the proper thing that you should do you can tell me even if something you consider to be secret and uh, which cannot be revealed to any outsider the gentlewoman says neither to you nor anyone the lady attendant steadily refuses to tell anything to reveal anything about what lady macbeth told or hora what lady macbeth um, exactly kept on doing during her sleepwalkings during her states of somnambulism and she says that i will not tell what she said or did either to you or to anyone else having no witness to confirm my speech as i have no witness to who can attest who can confirm what i say about my mistress say about my lady i do not think it proper to narrate those things to anybody then lady macbeth enters enter lady macbeth with a taper a taper is a slender a uh, thin sort of a candle and she says uh, uh, she here actually the gentlewoman keeps on um, telling the doctor lo you here she comes so now you look sir here lady macbeth comes she is her very guy this is her very guys this is her very here guys does not mean uh, disguise or dress here guys uh, simply means habitual manner ways this is her very guys this is the particular way in which she walks in her sleep and upon my life fast asleep and i will take an oath upon my own life that she is fast asleep she is not awake observe her stand close stand close so that you should not collide with her or you should not be seen by her if she um, if she rises from her sleep during her somnambulist state you observe her and stand closely you stand away from her and keep on watching her the doctor says how came she by that light the doctor is uh, quite uh, taken aback by lady macbeth's holding a candle in her hand when she has just come out of her bed so he asks how did she procure that candle the uh, gentlewoman replies why it stood by her she has lied by her continually tis her command the lady what uh, lady attendant replies that um, all the while a candle uh, stands by her bedside she has lied by her continually all round the day all round the clock she has a lighted candle beside her as per her command now you can easily think about the previous self of this lady macbeth who invoked dark night to conceal her crimes in in the fifth act of the sorry in the fifth scene of the first act around lines 50 51 we saw that lady macbeth was invoking night saying come thick night and pall thee in the dunst smoke of hell that my keen knife see not the wound it makes nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry hold hold so it is the same woman it is the same person who invoked 
the darkness of the night to cover up her wrongdoings now is very much afraid of darkness so much so that she orders that uh, a lighted candle should always be kept beside her bed even during night then the doctor says you see her eyes are open the doctor is a uh, slightly suspicious of the fact that lady macbeth is uh, really asleep and he says that you see that her eyes are open she is not she does not seem to be asleep the gentlewoman replies i but their sense is shut yes uh, the gentleman says that yes her eyes are wi wide open but uh, the sense the quality of perception in those eyes is uh, shut she cannot see anything with her open eyes the doctor says what is it she does now what is she doing now look how she rubs her hands the doctor says that lady macbeth is rubbing her hands because um, in her trance in her dream like somnambulist state lady macbeth thinks that she has she still has uh, spots of blood in her hand and she thinks that she is washing her hands as there is no water and as she is uh, doing everything in a state of trance the doctor can merely see her rubbing her hands in the manner of washing it wa washing them so he cannot fully understand the meaning of this gesture and he asks the gentlewoman what is what that action is that she is performing now the gentlewoman replies it is an accustomed action with her to seem thus washing her hands the gentlewoman says that uh, it is a habitual deed a habitual action with her Uh, to seem to be washing her hands in this way i have known her continue in this a quarter of an hour and for quite a long time for about 15 minutes uh, she keeps on washing her hands or rubbing her hands in the manner as if she is washing them and then we hear lady macbeth speak out for the first time in this scene she says yet here's a spot so in her trance in her dream lady macbeth thinks that she still has a spot of blood in her hand in spite of her uh, having washed her hands for quite a long time now we can uh, compare this uh, section of the text with a previous section in the second scene of the second act around lines um, 46 47 and later in line 64 and 65 where initially she told her husband that uh, a little amount of water is enough to wash away the spots of blood that were on macbeth's hand after having killed duncan so in act 2 scene 2 uh, around line 46 lady macbeth tells macbeth go get some water and wash this filthy witness from your hand so at that point of time when lady macbeth was a courageous and uh, staunch sort of a lady she thought that uh, she, she very naturally possessed the sense of logic and reason and thought that it is uh, very likely that a small amount of water would be enough to wash away the spot of blood from macbeth's hands and a little later in that particular scene in act 1 scene sorry act 2 scene 2 she further tells macbeth that her hands also are smeared with blood but she is not as much afraid as macbeth is uh, 
in line 64 in Act 2, Scene 2, Lady Macbeth tells, My hands are of your color. Both your hands and my hands are red with blood. But I shame to wear a heart so white. But I think it a matter of shame to be so afraid, to be so much uh, afraid by the sight of blood as you seem to be. Now we see a drastic change in her manner, in her ways of thinking. In her sleepwalking scene, she reveals her inner self to be a very fragile, timid and weak one. And she thinks that um, even after having washed her hands for a long time, there still remains that spot of blood. And on hearing Lady Macbeth speak for the first time, the doctor tells uh, the gentlewoman, Hark! She speaks. So notice, note, she is telling something. I will set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. Yes, set down might mean put down in uh, current usage of English language. Um, the doctor uh, says that he should take down, he should put down what uh, Lady Macbeth is telling so that he can strengthen his remembrance. Then Lady Macbeth uh, keeps on speaking rather deliriously. She says, Out, damned spot! Out, I say! One, two... So, she is not in a normal, rational state of mind. Uh, obviously, she is in a trance and uh, in her dreamlike state, she uh, orders the spot of blood to get out of her hands. She says, out, damn spot, out, I say. I command you to leave my hands. One, two, then she counts. Um, keeps on counting seconds. Um, then she says, why then, tis time to do it. Then, uh, actually... Uh, in her mind, several things keep on coming at one time. She has been thinking about her past crimes, the past deeds of both Macbeth and um, her, and everything um, come in a rather confused way in her mind. He says, uh, she says, why, then it is time to do it. Now it is the proper time to do it. Perhaps she has been alluding to the murder of Duncan. Then she says, Hell is murky. Hell is dark, as this particular night is. Hell is also dark. Then she says, These uh, dashes signify a shift in tone as well as the shift in the... Um, contents of her thoughts. What she says before a dash and after a dash do not have any similarity or any affinity in between them. They are completely different and disjointed from each other. Then she says, Fie, my lord, fie! Now, this is said apostrophically to Macbeth in a tone of chastisement, in a tone of um, of um, a tone of uh, uh, of scorn. She thinks that her husband has done something uh, regrettable, and says, "Fie, my lord, fie! A soldier and afeard. You are a soldier, and you seem to be afraid." What need we fear who knows it, when none can call our power to question, sorry, our power to account, which basically means uh, question. She says that, why are you so afraid in spite of being a soldier, my lord? Um, and why should we now bother about uh, who knows about what wrongdoings we committed? 
because now when we are holding absolute power in this country nobody can uh, call our sovereignty to question so we need not be afraid then there is uh, another shift in tone and um, the content of her speech she says yet who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him now uh, she thinks that um, the blood that came out of the corpse of duncan uh, is unceasing it is so profuse that it cannot be properly wiped out she says that who would have imagined that this old man this old king duncan uh, had so much blood in his body on hearing that the doctor suspects that um, lady macbeth and her husband must have committed the regicide themselves so she uh, says to the gentlewoman do you mark that so she asks the gentlewoman whether she noticed what lady macbeth had said uh, just then lady macbeth continues the thain of five had a wife where is she now though lady macbeth um, does not know exactly that macbeth had um, uh, macbeth has killed lady Mac macduff along with all her children she seems to have suspected the same and so in her trance she says the thane of five which refers to macduff had a wife where is she now this uh, suggests that she obviously have sus uh, she obviously has suspected her husband of having done something mysterious something unjust to the family of the thane of five then again there is a shift in her tone what will these hands never be clean meanwhile she has always been trying to clean her clean up her hands and she now ponders whether her hands are never to be fully cleaned no more that my lord no more that you mar all with this starting now this sentence uh, perhaps uh, alludes to macbeth's state of agitation during the banquet scene where macbeth um, marred or spoilt the merriment of the banquet by his um, starting by th by his uh, show of amazement and agitation in front of the company of lords and thanes so on hearing all these the doctor tells the gentlewoman to leave the sp uh, to leave the place because she has come to know what she should not have and uh, this secret knowledge might be harmful for her life so the doctor says go to go to you have known what you should not you have learned too much which might endanger your own life and the gentlewoman replies she has spoke what she should not so lady macbeth has revealed something which she should not have revealed i am sure of that heaven knows what she has known and the gentlewoman suspects that lady macbeth must have known something which um, has not yet been fully and explicitly uh, revealed to their ears but uh, she suspects that uh, lady macbeth must have known some very grave secrets and lady macbeth goes on with her delirium she says here's the smell of blood still all the perfumes of arabia will not sweeten this little hand oh 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 so uh, she is now seen smelling her own hands which she thinks that are still smeared with blood and sh in her trance in her dream she can smell um, the imaginary blood with which her hands are smeared and she says that not even all the perfumes of arabia will be able to 
blot out the traces of the smell of blood from my hands. Then she sighs very deeply. She exhales very deeply out of her anxiety and remorse. On hearing that deep sigh, the doctor says, what a sigh is there. The doctor can understand that um, the mind of Lady Macbeth is very much pained, very much uh, aggrieved by her strong sense of remorse. And he says, the heart is sorely charged. Her heart, her mind seems to be very deeply affected. The gentlewoman says, I would not have such a heart in my bosom for the dignity of the whole body. So the gentlewoman says that uh, I am not ready to harbor such a painful heart in my body at any cost. The doctor says, well, well, well. So the doctor obviously is um, thinking about something. And the gentlewoman says, pray God it, pray God it be, sir. So uh, the gentle gentleman utters a prayer and says that uh, what we can do is just to pray to God so that we may not have our hearts so polluted and so vitiated by our sins and our remorses for those sins. Then the doctor says, this disease is beyond my practice. Uh, this kind of uh, psychological illness is something which is um, which eludes sorry which eludes my practice which eludes my medical knowledge which is beyond the reach of my medical practice yet i have known those which have walked in their sleep who have died holily in their beds but i have known of some people who similarly walked in their sleeps but they died peacefully in their beds. Then Lady Macbeth uh, continues with her delirium and says, wash your hands, put on your nightgown, obviously these are apostrophically addressed to her husband, whom uh, she requests to wash his hands and then put on his nightgown, as she did after the murder of King Duncan was accomplished by Macbeth. Then also Lady Macbeth requested Macbeth to put on his nightgown and go to bed so that he might later appear in front of the company of lords and attendants as someone who is innocent and as someone who is unaware of what has happened inside his castle. Look not so pale, I tell you yet again, Banco's buried, he cannot come out on his <coughs> of his grave. Now, again she alludes to another very sinister secret. She says that, I am telling you again, you need not be afraid. Banco's buried, Banco is under his grave and uh, it is impossible for him to come out of his grave. So on hearing that, the doctor exclaims, even so, so did this couple did Macbeth and his wife go so far as to have killed Banco even? Lady Macbeth continues with the last part of her delirium. She says, To bed, to bed, there's knocking at the gate. Come, 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 give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed, to bed, to bed. With that she exits the stage and perhaps she is going to sleep once again. And then the doctor inquires, will she go now to bed? This is directed, addressed to the gentlewoman who knows about the ways of Lady Macbeth nowadays. And the lady replies directly. So after uh, finishing her sleepwalking, after finishing her delirium she will go directly to her bed then the doctor says foul whisperings are abroad so there are bad rumors here whisperings uh, signify rumors are abroad 
uh, are everywhere outside. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. So, crimes or deeds committed against nature are likely to bring about uh, unnatural troubles. The kinds of troubles, the kinds of problems which cannot be explained by uh, laws of nature. Infected minds to their deaf pillows will discharge their secrets. So, minds which are polluted, which are vitiated, infected, will reveal their dark secrets, their sinful secrets, to their pillows, which are deaf, because pillows are inanimate objects and they are, they must be deaf, they must be incapable of hearing and recording what are expressed to them. More needs she, the divine, than the physician. And now the physician, the doctor concludes that now at this moment of her anxiety, at this moment of her remorse, what she needs most is divine grace rather than medical treatment from a physician. God, God forgive us all. Look after her, remove from her the means of all annoyance and still keep eyes upon her. Um, this part of uh, the doctor's speech is addressed directly to the gentlewoman, the, to the lady attendant of Lady Macbeth, whom he requests to remove from the uh, from the vicinity of Lady Macbeth all such things which might arouse her annoyance, which might agitate her more. And he further requests uh, the lady attendant to always be vigilant to Lady Macbeth, to always keep her eyes on what um, she is doing. And at last he says, So good night, my mind she has mated and amazed my sight, I think but dare not speak. The doctor says that um, through her action and through her speech, Lady Macbeth has spoiled, has confounded my mind and she has amazed my sight, she has stupefied my eyesight and I keep on thinking but I dare not speak because I have also come across some dark secrets which if revealed from my own mouth would endanger my own life. And having said that, he bids farewell to the gentlewoman and the gentlewoman in her reply says good night good doctor and they both exit the stage so that is the end of the sleepwalking scene thank you for watching